Okay. So we are in the book of Acts. And last time I left you, we left it kind of in. Anybody remember the old Saturday morning cereals? You know, Penelope Pureheart is, she is tied to the railroad tracks. Woo, woo, train's coming. Will she marry Snidely Whiplash? Will Dudley Do-Right come in time to save her? Tune in next week, right? So that's where we left you guys last time. Paul and Silas have been preaching in Philippi. And Lydia and her family came to the Lord and other believers came to the Lord as they preached down alongside the river. And, you know, that was all in good because they weren't, because Paul and Silas weren't preaching directly at some people and so they were okay with it. But there was a little demon-possessed girl that was a fortune teller and there were men who were, who were, abusing her they were selling her fortune telling abilities through the demons and one day as she was crying these men are are know the most high god and they're here preaching salvation one day while she was heckling them with that message paul turned and said leave her demon and the demon did and i believe that she got saved that day and that and that's the time when when people get upset when you start meddling in their, in their lives because that girl who was providing them an occupation or, or money by their abusing that power, when that demon left, they lost it. And so they grabbed Paul and Silas and they drug them down into the city square and they got all kinds of people to get all kinds of upset because because they were yelling and screaming. And then they beat Paul and Silas. And we're going to pick up that story this morning. In verse 19, we're going to go back a couple of chapters and, uh, or a couple of verses in chapter 16. So Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. But when her masters saw that their hope for profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or observe being Romans. And the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And we'll stop there. You see, the, the world would like you to think, and this is today's world, would like you to think that we're the bigots, that we're intolerant. Did you notice what they said, what the problem was? They didn't tell the truth, did they? The problem was this demon-possessed girl that we've been abusing through the power of Satan has been set free. And when she was set free, it cost us our business. That was the problem. But what did they say the problem was? These guys are Jews. Now remember, going back a couple weeks ago, there wasn't a synagogue. There wasn't a synagogue in Philippi because they couldn't get 10 Jewish men together to create a synagogue. It's pretty easy to pick out the minority to pick on, isn't it? They said, they're Jews and we're Romans. They just forgot to realize that Paul and Silas were also Romans. Now, Paul and Silas didn't bring that up. They probably couldn't even get words out because they got everybody, everybody in a tizzy over that. And so they persecuted them 
for having set this young woman free. And that's happening today. It's when people are set free from the bondage of Satan's lie, they come after the, they come after the people that are preaching that gospel, right? Jesus is here to set us free. He's not here to put us in bondage. And when, when that happens, people get upset. And, but God said, listen, I want you to be ready because this is nothing new. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way that they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is nothing new. People are going to hate you because of who you believe in. The fact that God works miracles. Drug dealers don't like it when people get clean and sober. The bars don't like it when their best customer gets saved and quits drinking. You see, when God begins to work, people get upset because it affects the bottom line. When D.L. Moody was preaching in Chicago during the Great Crusade of that of his time, bars would shut down because all the people would flock to hear him preach. They didn't like that. And the people get people will persecute you. In 2 Timothy 3:12 it says indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be what? persecuted. We don't like that. That's that's no fun. That's not one of those really good verses in the Bible you went, "Oh, this is my life verse." Right? But the world beat them down. Paul and Silas were beaten down physically. They were beaten down physically. My sermon today was entitled what? Singing when? In the midnight hour. And we're going to get Paul and Silas there, but before we get to the midnight hour, I want you to understand, they were beaten down. And I, and I imagine that there are people sitting in this room today that are beaten down. There are some, some that are beaten down because of their health. They're beaten down because of disease. And, and you're like, going, oh, man. I've got, to, I've got to go back to the doctor again. I've got this wrong. I've got that wrong. You know, we have a saying at Brookdale, which I, I teach classes a couple of days a week at the different Brookdales. Getting old is not for sissies. And some of you have been beaten down just by what's going on physically in your body. Paul and Silas had been beaten with rods. They were hurting. Some of us have been beaten down by the world. Because this is really common. The world tells us what? You're not good enough. Have you ever heard that? Have you been beaten down by that? I remember as a little little boy, uh, I was born with a, with a defect in my mouth, and I couldn't say my S's, and I lisped really bad. And I can remember out on the playground the words. You know, the old saying, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you, is a lie from the devil. The Bible says that your tongue, 
your tongue is probably the, the most evil thing on your body. Because we can destroy people. You're not good enough. You're not a good enough husband. You're not a good enough wife. You're not a good enough parent. You're not a good enough provider. You're not a good enough worker. You're not a good enough Christian. Ooh, that hurts, doesn't it? You're not enough. That's what the world says. And you're beaten down. You're beaten down because... The world says you're not enough, and some of you have been beaten down by your own guilt of your past. You've never been able to forgive yourself for what's happened in the past, and you've beaten yourself down to the point that you're in the midnight hour. Paul and Silas were in the midnight hour. I want you to look at 23 to 28. I'm sorry, folks. This this message has weighed very heavy on my heart all this week. I got a number of calls throughout the week. People people telling me, Pastor, I don't know anybody else to call. Sometimes I think I don't have the magic answer. But I will sit here with you in the midnight hour and we will sing together. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison and commanded the jailer to guard them securely And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, and they were singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not Harm yourself, for we are all here. (laughs) Amen. I mean, if you don't get excited about what God does in the midnight hour, I don't know what you can get excited about. Because I want you to understand that Paul and Silas's situation didn't get better, it got worse. It didn't get better. You would think they got beaten, right? What could, what could be worse than that? They had a jailer who decided that he's going to do his job as the best that he can. So what does he do? He takes them. They've been beaten, right? He takes them and he puts them where? In the very, the very center of the jail. There's no windows in the center of the jail. And then what does he do? He locks them up in stocks. Okay, can you imagine? Here they are, their feet and their hands are fastened tightly. They can't lay down. They can't rub the sore spots. All they can do, they can't even hold their, each other's hand and commiserate with each other. They're in utter darkness. You ever, you ever been to a cave and they tell you, you know, we did this at Carlsbad Cavern. You get way, way down in there and they tell you, all right, everybody has a headlamp. And then they tell you, shut off your headlamp. And you do and you're standing there and you're like going, where, where, where is, that's where they were. It didn't get better. It didn't get, it got worse. But what did they do? 
they started to pray and sing. I imagine their singing may have started out as moaning. Mm, Oh, Lord. And then they began to sing. Now, I realize that they didn't sing the songs that we sing today. So I'm going to bring it forward a few thousand years. Is that all right? Because they would have sang the psalms, right? They may have sang the the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, right? They may have sung that. But I think they started out with a moan, Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder. I don't know what they sang that, that night, but they began to sing. And you know why they could sing? Because they had memorized the music. You know, music is the number one comment that I get on comment cards to coming to the office. It's too loud. It's too, too, there's too many songs. There's not enough songs. There's not enough old songs. There's not enough new songs. That's, it's the number, and, and I praise God because it means you're listening. You're here. You see, the one thing that we miss out on is, 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 is when we memorize the music, it doesn't matter where we are, we can sing the music. Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby was blind when she was a little girl. She, she never remembered her sight, never remembered seeing anything. Fanny Crosby wrote more secular songs than she did hymns. But if you look through your hymn book, there's many, many songs by Fanny Crosby. Blind from birth. And one day a secular publisher said, Fanny, you're not making any money on that gospel music. Why, you wouldn't even know Jesus if he came up to you here in this meeting today. And Fanny Crosby went home and she wrote, When my wild life's work is ended and I cross the swelling tide and the glorious face of Jesus I behold, I will know my Redeemer when I reach the other side. For his smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know him, I shall know him. When redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him. By the prince of the nails in his hands. You see, Fanny... Had ne- would never see the face of anybody on this earth, but the very first face that she knew she would see would be Jesus. You see, when we're in the midnight hour, we need to be able to sing our songs. We need to be able to, and some of us think, oh, the, the, and I love the old hymns. I grew up on the old hymns. I still have many of them memorized today because that's, what I led when I, was, when I was 15 years old, I started leading music for our church. And so I memorized the old hymns. But you know what? I love the songs of today also. He's the way maker, the miracle worker, right? We need to, we need to embrace the world. Did you realize that most of the hymns were written back when they were written in the late 1800s were set to bar music? They were. You go back and listen to secular music from the eight, late 1800s and you put them with the, with the hymns that were written. It's the same music because the people needed something that they could put with because they couldn't take their hymn book home with them. They didn't even have hymn books. So they taught them how to sing to the music of the day. And I love the fact that our little kids are, are up here learning how much Jesus loves them. They're memorizing these things. When I was, uh, I grew up listening to, to country music. I won't sing country music for you today. 
But when I was my first year in college, I got, uh, well, I should say, uh, when, I, when I made it into high school and had my own stereo in 1973, four. Right, Chris? Where's Chris at? We'll do that guitar pose, right? Black Sabbath. You name it, I listen to it. I got to college and God convicted me about my music. And so I said, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to listen to all Christmas, Christian music. KPDQ in Portland, my first year, was a Christian station. I began listening to, to music. And, of course, we had Kayla. It was, it was K-Happy back then. K-H-P-E. K-Happy. Now it's K-Hope K here. Quill. And I started listening to gospel music. And you say, well, what's the big deal if I listen to a little bit of music? What you fill your mind with is what's going to happen. Matter of fact, there's a little verse about that in there. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will prove what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, if you fill your mind with, with godly music, with Christian music, it, it's going to come back out that way. I was in a car wreck on my way back one night. I've told the story before. My face went through the windshield. My knee tore out the gear shift. They hauled me off. The paramedic told the driver, you can slow down. This kid's not going to make it. They took me into the hospital. And back in those days, they didn't have an ER trauma doc. They had a local surgeon. He was a thoracic surgeon, was on duty that night. And he took me in. And he said, because I was totally unconscious, they began to sew me up. I took 40 stitches to sew my ear back on and sew my face back together. Took another 40 to sew my knee back together. And he came in the next day while I was in the hospital. He said, the strangest thing happened. I've never experienced this in my life, either as a, as a thoracic surgeon or as in the ER. But we didn't have to sedate you to sew you up because you were totally unconscious when you came in. And as we began to sew you up, you began to sing gospel songs. And the entire time that I sewed you up, I listened to you sing gospel songs. Whatever you put in here gets stored here and comes out here. You see, in the midnight hours when you've been beaten down, when you don't even have any words to say, God brings those back. Now, I want you to understand, this isn't just about them because they began to sing. I don't know what they sang, but as they began to sing, the prisoners were listening. Did you catch that? They had a captive audience. That's pretty cool, isn't it? They had a captive audience. The prisoners were listening. You know, most of, most of the time, you know, we, if somebody starts singing, you know, you plug your ears, right? <laughs> Trying to sleep. But the prisoners were listening. You see, sometimes when we sing, we're ministering to others. We're ministering to those around us, people that may not even realize what you're going through. You see, there's a lot of times when we're in the midnight hour and the people around us have no clue what we're going through. And when we begin to sing and when we begin to pray and God opens up the doors of heaven, they're listening. When my grandmother died, right here in Albany General Hospital, she was in the ICU for four days with a ruptured gallbladder. She had peritonitis. And we made the, the decision. The doctors came in and said, she has no chance of survival. And so we knew she had had a living will. So we said, okay. Started unplugging all the machines. She says, this could go very rapidly. Or it could take a while. We don't know. Death is odd. And so we unplugged her. And all of a sudden, she opened up her eyes. And she, she said, we were like, Grandma, what, what 
how can we help you? She said, would you sing? So we began to sing the old hymns. And as things got, went along, and she began to, she would tense up a little bit, and we'd watch the heart monitor, and then we'd sing another song, and that beat would go back. And then pretty soon it started to slow down, and it was 11, 12.30 at night. There was only a couple other patients in the ICU, and so the nurses said, you can bring your family in. And, and there was 12 of us standing around my grandmother's bedside, and we began to sing in the garden. And we watched as her heartbeat slowed, and we sang my grandma into heaven. I turned around, and here was the entire ICU staff standing outside the door of my grandmother's room in tears. They said, you don't know what this means to us. We don't see this very often. As a matter of fact, the majority of the people that we see here in the ICU go into eternity screaming or crying. We don't see this. You see, sometimes people are listening that we have no clue. When we choose to sing in that midnight hour, Well, I want you to notice something else. That by singing in the midnight hour, it didn't change, it changed their perspective, not their circumstance. What had happened? The earthquake came, the doors were flung open, the chains were let go, the stocks that were holding them tight. But where was Paul and Silas? I know if that had happened to me, I'm gone. I'm out of here. But not Paul and Silas. What did they do? They began checking on the other prisoners. Did you notice what they, what they said when the, when the jailer came up and was about to kill himself? Don't worry. We're all here. Paul and Silas... They weren't worried about the stripes on their back. They were worried about, is everybody okay? So they began to go around and they began to check on the other prisoners. And, the, and here comes the jailer. And he runs up and he's like, oh man, what happens if you lose your prisoner as a Roman soldier? Death penalty. You're going to be executed. And he says, ah, I'm not going to go through that. He pulls out his sword and Paul says, wait. We're all here. It changed their perspective. I imagine Paul and Silas, when they began to pray, were like going, okay, God, you did this for Peter. Can you get us out of here? But you know, they also remembered they had prayed for James and James was beheaded. They didn't know what their circumstance was going to be. But as they prayed, God changed their perspective. He says, don't worry about yourself. I've got you. And that's what God says to each of us in our midnight hour. Don't you worry about yourself. I've got you. You worry about these others. You worry about the Philippian jailer. Because if you make the jail break, he's dead. And I've got plans for him. So you don't worry about yourself. I'll take care of you. Their perspective had changed, but not their circumstance. Well, let's look and see what happens now in verses 27 through 40. And when the jailer awoke and saw the doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice and said, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. 
And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, and you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. And when the day came, the chief magistrate sent the policeman saying, release the men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the chief magistrates are sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. And Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial. Men who are Romans and have thrown us into prison, and now are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. And the policemen were hearing these words, reported these words to the chief magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came and pleaded to them. When they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. And they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. You see, when you, when you pray and you sing in the midnight hours, you not, only, you not only affect those around you, but sometimes you affect those who are far away. The Philippian jailer didn't live in the jail. He lived next door. He had a whole household that lived next door. His family, his servants all lived. They probably couldn't hear the singing from inside of the jail because Paul and Silas were in the very center. But because Paul and Silas had been faithful in preaching... I imagine that this Philippian jailer had heard about them. Who are these guys that have the, who's the, the, the girl that's running around that, that saying these guys are from the Lord Most High that preach salvation? Who are these guys that are preaching? And, and I find it interesting that when he comes and gets them, Brings the candlelight in. What did he call them? Sirs. <laughs> now I've worked. I, I worked for thirty-one years in law enforcement, and I was in the jail bringing people in and out quite a bit. I don't know how many times I ever heard somebody, a, a, a jailer, talking to a prisoner that I brought in. They called him sir. Especially ones that, <laughs> you know, might be ready to escape. But he said, sirs. What? And then what does he say? What must I do to be saved? You see, God had been working in his heart. And he realized that they held him in their hand. Because could he have stopped all of them from escaping? No way. One man, Paul and Silas and all these others, they could have just, what must I do to be saved? And he was like, well, you know, maybe I could give you a bribe not to leave. And what did they say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your household. And then it says he brought them into his house. Now, what do you do when you have a jail that all the doors are sprung on? And he had all these prisoners. I believe he brought all of the prisoners into his house. And it says that Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord to him and all his house. And his whole household got saved that night. 
And they got baptized together. And, the, and God began to, to build his church, right? You see, they thought that God was going to bring the miracle through the earthquake. But you know what the miracle was? Was the Philippian jailer. The miracle that God wanted to give them that night was the jailer and his house. When people get saved, it creates a miracle that nobody can deny. And so the Philippian jailer got saved and his household got saved. And I imagine some of those prisoners got saved that night. And they got added to the church that was already started in Philippi. I imagine that when, when they, they got done and they got released, they said, hey, come on, come on, let's all, we're all going over to Lydia's house. You've got to meet this lady. You've got to meet the other believers because that's what believers need is to be together. And so they, they took the Philippian jailer and his family and these, these yahoos that were in jail and got saved and they all went over to Lydia's house. And it, they got together and they said, we're... We're the first church of Philippi now. We're growing. God is saving entire families. You see, God shows up right on time. God shows up right on time. God could have showed up in the marketplace when they drug Paul and Silas down to the center of the marketplace. God could have showed up then and said, hey, listen, you could have done like what he did with Philip. I'm going to put you over here. I'm going to take you someplace else. He could have done that. No, God says... I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you guys aren't going to like this. You're going to get beaten. But I've got a purpose. I've got a Philippian jailer over here that you need to meet that's ready to get saved, him and his family. That was God showed up exactly when he needed to. And there are some times when we're going through the midnight hour and we're crying, God, please, please, Take me out of this. And God is saying, you're not ready yet. I have plans for someone else that you need to be singing in the midnight hour for them to hear. So hang on. Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. Weeping only lasts for the night. Right? God says the morning hasn't come yet. It's going to come. Hold on. But I have plans for somebody else that you are going to meet in the midnight hour. And I'll be there. See, we don't always understand it. Second Peter 3, 8 and 9 tells us, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any to perish, but all to come to repentance. You see, it's not always about you in the middle of the midnight hour. Sometimes it's about the Philippian jailer and his family that came to know Jesus because Paul and Silas were faithful to the Lord. And then I'm going to leave you with one last thing because I think this is important. Paul and Silas were not going to allow the magistrates to get away with what they did. Paul and Silas says, oh, by the way, Notice the marks on the back? Paul and Silas are Romans. Roman law says you cannot beat a Roman. You can't put a Roman in chains until he's had a hearing. 
You guys think we're just going to slink off? No, you come and take us out of the jail and tell everybody that you were wrong. Boy, get the magistrate to do that, that's pretty good news. But I, here's, here's what I want you to take away. Just because you're a Christian does not mean you give up your rights as a citizen. Now, folks, we're, we, are in a, we are in a time in our country where people don't like to hear the Christian view, the Christian worldview. People don't like to hear that life is sacred. They don't like to hear that God created man and woman. They don't like to hear those things. They would like you to believe that you don't have a right to express yourself in the public arena because you don't believe what everybody else does. No, not on your life. You have the right, and I believe the responsibility to be not only a citizen, but a Christian citizen. We need to stand up for what God says. I don't know how many of you right now are in your midnight hour. But I want to pray for you right now before we get on to communion. I want to pray that wherever you are, that you'll begin to sing in the midnight hour. You'll begin to pray in that midnight hour so that God will show you what he has for you on the other side. Because I promise you there is the other side. There's the other side of the midnight hour and it's called the dawn. And God's waiting there to show you what he has for you. Our Heavenly Father, I don't know who's here today that is in their midnight hour. They're hurting. They've been beat down whether it's physically or by the world or just by their own, their own thanking. God, I just pray that those who are in the midnight hour tonight today, that God, you would just, you would just touch them, open their minds, allow them to sing in the midnight hour, allow them to pray, and let you know exactly what's going on with them. And Lord, then will you just share with them, I've got something that you'll never expect on the other side of midnight. On the other side of midnight, there's a Philippian jailer. On the other side of midnight, there's healing for their stripes. On the other side of midnight, there's freedom from their addiction. On the other side of midnight, there's freedom from their captivity. God, I just pray that, that you would just release whatever's going on today. That in the midnight hour, we will sing and we will pray. And you will be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus had a midnight hour. It was called the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus went and he took his three, three favorite guys, Peter, James, and John, and he said, you guys stay here and pray. I've got to go over and talk to the Father says that he was in such stress that he sweat drops of blood. But he prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And then he went to the cross. And he shed his blood for each one of us, his body would be broken for each one of us.